comic book fans, and welcome to Cammy's Comic Corner. I'm your host, as always, Cammy. Now, spoiler warning, all the books I'm talking about this week, I'm going in detail, I'm going to spoil some things. So this is a, your official spoiler warning. If you don't, if you haven't read your books yet, and you don't want to be spoiled, pause, go read your books, come back, because unlike other podcasts, I'll be there for you when the rain starts to fall. Now, moving on to the pick of the week. From Marvel, we have Marvel 1985, written by Mark Millar and art by Tommy Lee Edwards. Now, the thing about this book is, I know it's kind of cliche, but when you're that young of age and you open your first comic book and you're just mesmerized by all the characters on the page and you just wish that you lived in that world, well, this is what happens in Marvel 1985. The year, as you can probably predict, is 1985. It focuses around a 13-year-old boy named Toby. His parents are going through a divorce and he just picked up an, uh, an uh, issue of Iron Man, just a random issue, and then he was just mesmerized. And it takes place in the... He's right now reading a lot of Secret War stuff that's going on, and he's just collecting Marvel titles left and right. He could be collecting others, but, you know, this is a Marvel book, so why not have just Marvel titles the kids collecting? Anyway, so he's hanging out with his dad. They go by this old mansion, and they notice people are moving in, and, you know... The guy kind of looks familiar, and, you know, while his dad's talking to the guy about it's going to be a hotel or, you know, a bed and breakfast or whatnot, Toby looks up through the mirror, and, or up, up through the window, and he sees Red Skull. He sees Red Skull. He's just shocked. He, you know, rubs his eyes, looks back again, no more Red Skull. Where, where the hell did Red Skull go? And that's what happens in this comic. That's the idea that the Marvel Universe is starting to bleed into our own universe in 1985, and T Toby goes back at night just to see, uh, see what's really going on at the mansion because there were reports earlier on TV of a winged green man, and he was photographed by many people. The Vulture, of course. What the fuck? Uh, the Vulture? Uh, Red Skull? Who the hell else is here? Well, he finds out that Mole Man's there, and Dr. Victor Von Doom is there. So, so as he gets the hell out of there because Dr. Doom's alerted to his presence, he runs into a tree, but that's no tree. That's something completely different. Very good idea for a comic book. Because it makes you, like me, I had a very active imagination as a child. And I wish I could have been hanging with Spider-Man or Batman or getting rides, piggyback rides from Superman. It would have just blown my mind. So this is kind of a, kind of a nice issue for all you fans out there who really wish you could live in comics. Now, on to the Fast Five. First up, we have Giant Size X-Men number one. Now, this is the final big conclusion on John Cassidy and Josh Whedon's run on the Astonishing X-Men title. It gets kind of confusing, and you kind of have to remember where you left off from previously, because it's been so long in between uh, issue, I believe, 27 or 28 it was, to the Giant Size issue right now. So you gotta, you gotta take a second, go, oh wait, that's right, that's where we left off. A big bullet's going towards Earth, and Kitty Pride's stuck inside. And unlike any other X-Men book, it's finally a goodbye at the end that doesn't involve Jean and Cyclops. Because, you know, it's always, oh, Jean's gone again, oh, boo-hoo-hoo, I'm depressed, I'm gonna go, bang, Emma Frost. No, in this one, Kitty Pride is going to save the world. And that's what she does. It takes all of her concentration, but she phases the bullet through Earth. And to continue off into space. A very good issue, and I highly recommend the Astonishing X-Men run to anyone who hasn't picked up X-Men before. It's going to be a very good hardcover, too. Next up, from DC, we have Green Lantern number 31. Now, in this part three of Hal Jordan's origin story, we follow his first days in training on the planet Oa, and his first encounter with Kilowog. And believe it or not, Hal Jordan was a poozer at one time. As we see, his ring slinging abilities get only toppled by Kilowog in this issue. And the introduction of Tomar Ray talking to Hal Jordan about Abin Sur and finding out what happened to him because Tomar Ray immediately recognizes that, hey, that's Abin Sur's ring. Something happened. Again, what a good origin story issue. This is going to be the origin story that many new readers are going to remember 
and help appreciate Hal Jordan as Green Lantern. Thank you, Jeff Jones. Next up from Virgin Comics, we have Dan Dare number six. Now, in the previous issue, Dan Dare was captured, and just as it seems that he was going to be tortured by Mekon's minions, well, the British fleet teleport right in the middle of Mekon's ship just to go get Dan Dare. They like the guy that much. And this issue, they rescue Dan Dare. Dan Dare and his cronies, they defeat the black hole technology. They Well, they sabotage it. That's what they do. So Mekon can't use it anymore. And that's the prime opportunity, before they can repair it, that Dan Dare decides to take the fleet into battle. And you know in the next final issue, that's going to end up with Dan Dare versus Mekon. It's just going to be, they're going to be slugging it out like a couple of Brits. It makes you forget that Garth Ennis can write beautiful stories without any shock value. And don't get me wrong, I love his shock value stuff too. Like The Boys, how can you go wrong? It's a great book.